morning. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jim Naughton from Canticle Communications, and I'll be uh, doing the hosting duties this morning. Um, we are gathered today, the, the group uh, that of, of grassroots uh, progressive Catholic leaders who are gathered today come from, it's a coalition. They come from a number of grassroots groups, and they organize under, under the umbrella of Catholic Organizations for Renewal. Um, as you know, the U.S. Bishops, U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference will be uh, meeting uh, beginning tomorrow, and they have a number of issues on their agenda where uh, the voice of the Catholic faithful is not being heard. Um, and so some of the Catholic faithful are here today to make sure that, that uh, something's done about that. Um, we've got five folks who will speak to you. Uh, brief statements, and then we'll take questions. Um, and our first speaker is Mary Ann Duddy Burke, who is the Executive Director of Dignity USA. Good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, my colleagues and I are here today representing Catholics who are deeply concerned about the fact that when USCCB, uh, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, meets this week, they will be determining whether to issue a document on withholding communion from pro-choice and other Catholics. And there are many, many reasons why we and two thirds of American Catholics as documented by the Pew Research Center in March of this year, find this deeply troubling. We wanna outline four major concerns. First, the denial of communion is pastorally harmful. Catholics believe that the Eucharist represents Jesus pouring out his life uh, as, a as a gesture of salvation for everyone. And when we, you withhold the sacrament from anyone, it puts them in a shameful and marginalized position within our church, as well as denying sustenance that we believe equips us for the mission of the gospel. Over the past several decades, the harmful pastoral implications of denying divorced and remarried Catholics, for example, communion, have been well, document, well documented and are really being looked at in a new way. So we ask, why would you withhold such a clear source of strength from a believer like President Biden who has such significant responsibilities to the larger community. Secondly, uh, our church's sacraments should never be used in, uh, as coercion. Catholics are taught that the sacraments are freely given and freely received. Pope Francis himself has stated that the Eucharist is, uh, and I'm quoting here, is not a prize for the perfect, but a powerful medicine and nourishment for the week. And that comes from uh, Amoris Laetitia. Communion uh, brings grace to the recipient. And so it is wrong to weaponize sacraments, especially the Eucharist. Thirdly, we find the partisan overtones in this debate to be deeply problematic. US Catholics are not monolithic in their beliefs. We hold a wide diversity of beliefs on a range of public issues, as well as party affiliation. Our church should not be aligned with either party, but should be able to provide a morally credible critique of a range of public policy issues. Unfortunately, our current Catholic leadership seems to be over-identified with one party ignoring gross ethical violations by Republicans while trying to clamp down very strongly on doctrinal differences held by Democrats like President Biden. We find that this is dangerous and undermines the purpose of our church, further divides our community and uh, impedes the ministerial effectiveness of our church. And finally, we see the denial of communion or the threat to deny communion as symbolic of denial of care in a whole range of other areas, violating our church's fundamental commitment to the human dignity of all people 
and our social justice duty to break down oppressive structures. So some of these areas that will be touched on today in, include uh, access to vital human services, anti-racism work, caring for children and other vulnerable people. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie Manson, who will speak to the, this concern in the context of abortion and reproductive health services. Thank you, Marianne, appreciate that. Good morning, everyone. As a pro-choice Catholic, President Biden finds himself in very good company among elected officials and the general Catholic population in the United States. The majority of Catholics in Congress also share pro-choice values, 76 in the House and 13 in the Senate. This latest move by the bishop would affect them all, including many of our elected officials who happen to be Eucharistic ministers, not simply Catholics who practice their faith. Pro-choice Catholic members of Congress are also in very good company among their constituents. There are 70 million Catholics in the United States, and according to the most recent Pew studies, 68% of Catholics do not want to see Roe versus Wade struck down. 56% believe, believe that abortion should be legal in all or most cases. 67% do not support denying communion to Catholic elected officials who support abortion rights legislation. Many of these Catholics believe in the right to abortion care, not in spite of being Catholic, but because they are Catholic. As Catholics, we believe in the primacy of conscience, which teaches that we must use God's gift of reason in all ethical discernment, and that the individual conscience is the final arbiter in all decision making. As Catholics, we also believe in a preferential option for the poor, which states that caring for the well being of the most disadvantaged must be our first priority. Access to abortion care is deeply intertwined with and exacerbated by systemic racism, economic insecurity, and immigration status. For these reasons, Catholics like Mr. Biden, who have a strong commitment to social justice and human dignity, believe in protecting abortion access. The wedding of anti-abortion beliefs with Catholic identity is a very recent occurrence, just in the last few decades. It is not a reflection of the Catholic faith. The truth is that the right wing uses the issue of abortion to activate a small segment of the population to pursue extreme conservative agendas that seek to take away civil rights from women, from LGBTQ people, and other vulnerable populations. Sadly, some of the US bishops have lost influence over their own flocks and are choosing instead to participate as far right political operatives. The abortion issue is exploited to amass political power by a faction of largely white privileged people who have proven they do not truly care about protecting life outside of the womb. We saw this very clearly when right wing Catholics invited Donald Trump to be the keynote speaker at the March for Life a man who daily showed cynical disregard for life in the way he treated immigrants, the earth, people on death row, among many other vulnerable people. It is glaringly hypocritical for the bishops to suddenly use their voice to condemn President Biden and other Catholic elected officials who use their consciences to support abortion rights. We've done some opposition research and information we have gleaned from legislative agencies in our own research reveals that in just, just seven states, in the space of less than seven years, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops spent between 10 and $11 million on lobbying. Sadly, the USCCB's press statements and social media make it clear that these lobbying efforts were less concerned with defending the poor and marginalized and instead were aimed at blocking legislation that would allow for abortion care or equal rights for LGBTQ people or justice for sex abuse victims. Faithful church going Catholics would be broken hearted if not deeply angry to hear that their donations, their hard earned money was being used to promote so much injustice. But sadly we have a church that wishes to spend its time and money trying to erode the civil rights of Americans through their lobbying efforts and through litigation in places like the Supreme Court, where they spend a lot of time in the last few years taking away civil rights. For more on that issue, I'll turn back to my longtime friend and colleague, Marianne Duddy-Burke. Thanks, Jamie. 
uh, it can't be ignored that the Supreme Court ruling in Fulton versus City of Philadelphia is due any day and could potentially come out as early as uh, Thursday while the bishops are meeting. I wanna acknowledge that on this issue, I'm speaking both as a concerned Catholic, but also as a married lesbian who has been a foster and adoptive parent for over 19 years now. My wife and I also experienced exactly what the Fulton case is about when as a lesbian couple, we were deemed unfit to apply for foster care licensure by Catholic Charities of Massachusetts in 2002. The Fulton case really presents a false choice between religious liberty in the way that uh, the USCCB and other conservative Christian leaders have defined it and the rights of LGBTQ plus individuals and couples. What it really is about is our church officials and other conservative leaders wanting to protect their ability to discriminate while still accepting public money. In this case, they're demonstrating their willingness to sacrifice the well being of our country's most vulnerable children to preserve the right to take public funds without complying with public laws. At least 72% of Catholics do not believe that service providers should be able to discriminate against LGBTQ people. Over and over again, we have seen Catholic bishops claim the right to prohibit same sex couples and individuals from becoming foster and adoptive parents because of their beliefs about what a family should be. The reality is that it is the children in foster care waiting for safe, stable, loving homes that bear the brunt of this fight. We know that same-sex couples are seven times more likely to be caring for foster or adoptive children than opposite-sex couples. And same-sex parents are also more likely to adopt children of color, sibling groups, kids with special needs, or older, harder to place children. So with over 440,000 children in foster care and over 120,000 children waiting for adoption across the country, shutting down any qualified adult from providing, from opening their hearts and their homes to these children in need clearly violates public policy goals for our nation. I, I also believe that uh, a decision in, uh, in favor of Fulton in this case um, will have far reaching and long lasting civil rights implications for many. If this becomes precedent and allows faith based organizations to accept public money, access to a whole range of social services could become more difficult for anybody who is deemed morally unfit by these providers. That could include not just LGBTQ plus people, but folks from uh, minority religions, folks whose marital status the provider disagrees with, even folks in interracial marriages. The, the, uh, the field for discrimination becomes very broad and that is very frightening in a pluralistic society. We believe that meeting basic human needs should take priority over any religious belief or church dogma. And we call on our bishops to demonstrate their commitment to this fundamental principle of our faith. And now my colleague, Glenn Northern, who's the domestic program manager at Catholics for Choice, will address some of the racial justice implications of their work. Thank you, Marianne. As a black Catholic, I implore the bishops, bread, not stones. Catholic respect for human dignity demands incompatibility with racism. Racism is anathema to our faith's teaching about social justice. And this is why as a black Catholic, I cannot help but be disappointed and feel a bit betrayed by the bishops relative silence on issues of race amidst their fixation with ending abortion and taking away LGBT rights. My brothers and sisters are literally 
choking on the racism that surrounds us, and you remain silent in ivory towers. This is not the Catholic social justice I learned growing up. Where were your voices over the past year when my sisters and brothers took to the streets to protest the latest murders and injustices visited upon black and brown people through the legacy of unchecked racism? Where, your, where were your voices as our community sought health care, including reproductive health care, in order to take care of ourselves and our families during the pandemic? Where are the bishops' voices as civil rights and voting rights are being stripped from black and brown communities? When did political expediency and partisanship supplant genuine listening, concern, and care for community? My parish piece growing up in a church in which I was an altar server was an older Irish Catholic priest who had formerly served in a black Catholic church in Harlem. He was wise, loving, and generous. He made my family, the only black family in our little church in upstate New York, feel at home. He was not afraid to speak about race. He was not afraid to talk about racism. He talked about his involvement in the civil rights movement. I learned about social justice in that environment. Now I work at Catholics for Choice, lifting up the voices of Catholics who believe that each of us is made in the image of God and capable of exercising our conscience to make important moral decisions about who to love and the size and shape of our families. Racism undergirds policies that in effect obstruct black and brown families disproportionately from accessing reproductive health care. At Catholics for Choice, we strive to live out Catholic social justice teachings, advocating for black and brown communities and any who are relegated to society's margins to have access to reproductive health care. Bread, not stones, bishops. We have suffered enough. As bishops, you have a role to play in eliminating racism and creating justice, but it will require you to take a deep, hard look at the browning faces of Catholicism and honor the lived experiences of the people of your church. And now I will pass to Deb Rose of Future Church. Thank you, Glenn. For the past eight years, I've served as executive director and now co-director of Future Church. But in a prior life, I served as the executive director of a domestic violence prevention agency and shelter. There, I witnessed daily the heroism of women seeking a life without violence for themselves and for their children. I know just how important the Violence Against Women Act, commonly referred to as VAWA, is for those who suffer violence in their relationships. And I wish every bishop in the United States could meet the women I have met and learn what it means to have courage from them. For more years than I'd like to admit, Catholic priests contributed to the problem of violence against women by counseling them to find ways to please their husbands in order to avoid divorce, literally at all costs. These churchmen enforced a narrow and rigid ideology of marriage rooted in very traditional gendered roles instead of following the example of Jesus in the gospel who always put the needs of the vulnerable first. Finally, in 1992, the US bishops wrote the pastoral letter, When I Call for Help, where they roundly condemned all violence against women and prioritized their safety. In 1994, when VAWA was instituted, they were strong supporters. And 10 years later, when they reissued that pastoral letter, they recommended that victims call the VAWA hotline. So it's heartbreaking to know that in the past decade, the bishops have turned their backs on vulnerable women and men who are suffering violence at the hands of intimate partners. Because VAWA now includes provisions explicitly protecting people in same-sex relationships, the USCCB is working to undermine it. They have decided to prioritize another ideology, this time their own narrowly conceived conception of gender identity, knowing full well they put LGBTQ lives in jeopardy.
while they admit VAWA strengthens protections against domestic violence and human trafficking, they continue to withhold their support. When victims of domestic violence ask for bread, the bishops offer stones. The same hold tr holds true for USCCB's opposition to the National Suicide Hotline. The hotline has been in place since 2004, but just last year, the Federal Communications Commission approved the use of a free three-digit number 988 to ensure that people in dire straits can easily access the hotline for immediate help. Again, the USCCB stood in opposition to funding for the National Suicide Hotline because it included funding for outreach to LGBTQ people, especially queer youth who are especially prone to suicidal thoughts and attempts. The gospel tells us that Jesus saved his most vociferous condemnations for those who sacrificed human lives to ideology. He called them blind guides, fools, vipers, and serpents. In this day and age, we call our bishops to follow the example of Jesus, to give victims of violence and those who are contemplating suicide bread instead of stones. It is the work of the gospel. And now I turn it over to my colleague, uh, Executive Director Kate McElwee of Women's Ordination Conference. Thank you, Deb. With little exception, the U.S. bishops twist every opportunity to be pastoral and make it not just political, but life-threatening, as you've heard today. We are on the threshold of what, what might be called a post-COVID church in the United States, and I wonder, where are the pastors for this moment? The U.S. Bishops' Conference is dangerously out of step with the vision of Pope Francis and would ra rather risk their diminishing credibility to fight culture wars over Zoom than tend to their own flock. Pope Francis recently opened the ministries of acolyte and lector to women and asked that each National Bishops' Conference determine a formation process. These ro roles for women in the church could enrich parish life and bring more care to the community. Unfortunately, creating a formation process to install women into these ministries does not appear to be on the agenda. There is a clear opportunity to include more women in the life of the church, a critical issue, particularly for young people, and yet women are expected to continue to wait for crumbs. Pope Francis has also called the global church to begin a synodal process so that the voices, hopes, and concerns of Catholics at the parish level might be heard at the next synod or gathering of bishops in Rome in 2023. This worldwide process is meant to begin in mid-October, but listening to the people of God is apparently not on the bishop's agenda at this meeting either. Gun violence, climate change, racism, income inequality, gender-based violence, these truly urgent issues in our nation are also not on the agenda. While not all issues can be tackled at one meeting, this obsessive campaign of Eucharistic coherence and culture war projects are not just a distraction from bigger issues, but amount to a kind of pastoral negligence. And far from symbolic, chasing down of doctrinal differences, upholding structural inequality, and the extending of far-reaching and hateful gender policies risk the very lives of women, people of color, and the LGBTQ plus community, as my colleagues have outlined. My hope as a Catholic is for the church that a church that has the courage to walk with its people through the complexities of their lives, that breathes life into and through its ministries and welcomes all to the table. Where are the pastors for this moment? Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, if you would like to raise a question, uh, yeah, if you would like to ask a question, use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and uh, our tech people will let me know who wants to speak and I'll call on you. Um, so this would be, this is a, a moment to open things up to the members of the media who are here. You can also use the Q&A function to submit the question in writing. 
and I'll read it for you. So if you need uh, to make sure that you're spelling folks' names right, uh, we've got those in the chat. We've got titles in the chat uh, and links to all of the organization's websites also in the chat. If we don't have questions, I'm going to uh, let, let everyone go about their day, uh, but we'll hold on just a, a few more seconds to see if, uh, to see if anyone wants to ask anything. Okay, well, listen, thank you everyone for coming. We really appreciate it. Uh, you can reach uh, me if you need to uh, ask any questions about what's been going on today uh, at Jim at canticlecommunications.com. And I'm just dropping that in the chat right now. Um, and this recording will be available on the website of some of the groups. And if you're interested in that, please uh, let me know um, because I, I don't have the URL yet, but I will have it uh, relatively soon and I'll get it to you. Oh, I do see uh, one hand raised now. So let me see what's, what's happening there. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Bernard O'Brien, please go ahead. Yes, hi, how you doing? Um, thank you for the uh, program. Yeah, you can't see me. I'm trying to figure out how to turn my camera on. I, I can't do that. I had a question, um, you know, about the the amount that the church spends on lobbying and whatnot. I find that so interesting. And I know I'm calling from New York City and up. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, neighborhood Catholic schools that have had to close, and there's always, uh, you know, a lot of sadness when these schools have to close and the, you know, the cardinal or whatever says it's for financial reasons. So I would love, you know, one of these parents of like a distraught kid who's losing their Catholic school to say, hey, what do you mean we can't afford to keep the school open? How much are you spending on lobbying to prevent uh, you know reproductive rights <laughs> i'd love there to be some connection between uh you know catholic school closings and uh you know uh what what they're spending on lobbying so i hope that makes sense as a question anybody want to speak to that uh, sure uh bernard i can very briefly uh respond to that. We're in the early stages of our OPPO research right now um, on this issue. One of the one of the problems, the the obstacles we're running into is that the USCCB is exempt um, thanks to the Lobby Disclosure Act of 1995. Um, they do not have to disclose their lobbying spending or name their lobbyists. So we are we have to track uh, through state conferences, dioceses, Dioceses, excuse me, and other organizations um, that paid outside firms to lobby on their behalf. So there's, that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg as to to what they're spending. Um, but I agree with you. I think it would um, it would it would make many Catholics distraught to think that that is how their money is being spent. Uh, certainly. Anybody else? Any other questions? Marianne, do you want to speak to that? I saw you raise your hand. Um, yeah, Bernard, I, I think you're exactly, uh, your question really reflects exactly the goals of our conversation today. I think that uh, most Catholics expect that their bishops are about taking care of people and are going to be appalled when they start thinking about the priorities that the bishops have chosen to pursue rather than attending to all of the needs that exist across our country and throughout the world. And what we're hoping is that the conversations like this, putting out uh, information like the oppo research that Catholics for Choice is doing and raising these issues will empower Catholics to, uh, to assert their expectations to their bishops and that our church can somehow get back on the right track. Thanks, Marianne. 
Any other questions before we, we sign off today? Okay, thank you all for coming. I will really appreciate it. Again, you can reach me with any questions um, and we will be posting this recording on, on some of the websites of the group. Thank you again.